I do humbly pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. What was your lasting impression of the gospel? Hmm. You don't know? Hmm, I know. How many remember the first part of the, the uh, parable? How many remember what took place with the person with one talent? Yeah. What happened to that fella? Dum da dum dum. Yeah, it was. This is a tough parable. But we need to unpack it. Uh, but before I do, I'd like us to, to look at this gospel and particularly, and also 1 Thessalonians, as a particular, they're written in context. And I want to talk about the context in which we live and how it impacts upon what we hear and what we see about these two uh, passages from Scripture, particularly the gospel, the gospel of the talents, as it is said. It is a story that is eternal and timeless. But before I do, we all gather towards the end of the Christian year. Next week will be Christ the King Sunday. This is the next, the last Sunday of Pentecost. And so the readings that you hear both last week, this week, and particularly Christ the King are about the future, about the future and the second coming often, how we perceive that moment in time when Christ will come again because we're at the end of the year and we begin a new cycle in a couple of weeks. So that's what is on my thoughts as we enter today. What is also on my thoughts is that uh, this is our Thanksgiving gathering. We're gonna gather as a parish family in one table to share a common meal with those that we worship with and ministry with, pray with, and have a life together in the body of Christ. That's significant for me. As a parish priest for 47 years, that is significant that we come together to share in a meal together for Thanksgiving. We also will have Thanksgiving with our family and friends, perhaps. How many will have Thanksgiving away or near with family or friends this coming Thursday? Now, I have to tell you now um, that uh, our Thanksgiving meal is going to be different this year, and it has moved me and Jane out of our comfort zone in that Jane, uh, our daughters, both Rebecca and Amanda, have said no to turkey. <laughs> That's a big deal for me. <laughs> Instead, we're going to have ham, and snow crab. Not so bad, I realize. <laughs> but it's different. Keep that in mind. And finally, we gather together in celebration and thanksgiving for our life together through our pledges. Today is the end gathering. Today is the day in which we say to one another and to the church and to God, this is who we are. Our time, talent, and treasures are brought today to share together in our life in Christ. And so all, all that is mingling with the gospel lesson today. The gospel lesson is about three people that receive different talents according to their ability. So right away, what I'm seeing is that my talents may not be yours and yours won't be mine, 
You may have more talent than me, but I have talent. And so I want us to take a look at that. Because for a long time, I've always seen this particular parable of Jesus, the parable of the talents, in terms of not money as it was originally told in that original parable. But we've translated into what is our talents that we give in honor of God. And I have to tell you, over the years, that has been a bugaboo for me. It's been that moment in time where I say, have I been put in a wrong line where God is handing out talent and the other line has more talent than I could ever dream? I'm in the wrong line. Has anyone ever thought that? No, no one here. No one here. But there's a way to take a look at this in three different ways that may be helpful to us as we try to understand this particular parable at this particular time in our lives together. It is a parable that talks about Jesus having a particular issue in dialogue probably with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they were going back and forth. And they were trying to trip him up as often as they could. And so he tells them this parable. And the person with the one talent, perhaps he's speaking to those Pharisees who were so rigid in terms of the purity of their faith that there was no wiggle room for them, no room for enlightenment or sense the spirit moving through the body. And so he's pointing out to them that there's more to life than the law and that he would ask them to at least listen to what he's saying in terms of the power of each individual. The early church looked at this and took this parable and provided an allegorical understanding in which the man that is the estate owner goes away, that is Christ, and he goes away for a long time, the ascension, and we don't know when he's coming back. And when he does come back, there is a cost and people will have to earn. So it's a moral imperative. This parable becomes a moral imperative for that early church. That's a tough one. But there's a third way. A third way to look at this, and perhaps other ways, but one that I, in particular, is that we can look at this parable instead of always looking at the end of the story. It's a parable about abundance and about scarcity. I dare say that in this gathering here present, there's a multitude abundance of talent in this sanctuary. Enough, more than enough, to share the very presence of Christ in the world about us. For we are the arms and the legs and the heart of Christ. We are made in the image of God. And in that image, we are asked to be so transparent enough that Christ sees through us. and that Christ shines into the world. Even as imperfect as we are, it is always difficult for me to see my life in abundance rather than scarcity. Scarcity, fearfulness. Scarcity in terms of do I have enough? 
scarcity. Do I have enough talent to do what God has called me to do in my life? And I think Christ on the cross and resurrected says to us, we have more than enough to enter into that world and share the very presence of Christ to a world that desperately needs us. Given the gifts and talents that we all possess, Bishop Rose, who retired as the Bishop of Rochester, Diocese of Rochester, he said, over the years, I have discovered over and over again an abundance of talents with those that I have come into contact with, not just the clergy, but the entire diocese. He has seen over and over again an abundance of talent. But then he says, and that talent is provided by the gift of God through the Holy Spirit. But he also says, not one person has it all. And there lies the difference. As imperfect as we are, together we make the body of Christ. Together we are the image of Christ in the world. And so what you have and what I have and what everyone in this particular parish has is more than enough to give light to salvation to the world. There was an experience, an experiment at St. Alfred's Palm Harbor, Florida. The rector and um, the vestry over a few months uh, wrestled with the idea of separating the budget by $1,000 and using it for a stewardship model. And so on a particular Sunday, we asked for 20 volunteers. And the next Sunday, people thought about that, and the next Sunday they came back, 20 came back saying yes, out of a parish of about 800 came back and said yes, we want to participate. They were given no more than $100 per envelope. Um, but there was no name on the envelope and we didn't know who got what. And the ages rang from 11 years old to 91 years old. And they had six weeks to come back uh, with their stewardship project. And um, there was no fear and trembling with me maybe with the vestry, but not with me. And, um, but we asked them that they would write up a little bit about their experience, the joys, the heartaches, what it is that brought them to do what they did in terms of what they gave. And then at the end, they were to put what they received in an envelope unmarked back to the parish with no names. One 11-year-old girl um, babysat in the neighborhood and asked for a free will offering for over the six weeks. A teenager uh, borrowed his father's lawnmower without his permission and uh, cut grass for a few weeks. The one that really touched me was the 91-year-old lady in the parish who was the longest-serving member of the parish. Um, she had spanned almost 100 years, and so she took it upon herself to write a history, not about herself, but a history about what that 90 years looked like in terms of history because she felt that in her lifetime she had seen more history in that span of time than many see in many years past, in centuries past. And what she also said is she didn't do it alone. She created a booklet, shiny, with pages, typing, and I don't think she did all the typing and she didn't do all the graphics. And then she sold it at church for a free will offering uh, after church for six weeks. And um, all I can tell you is it sold out. And it was a beautiful testament, not to her own life, 
but what she saw and experienced in her life. She also was gratified by the help she received by others in the parish. Now the question I received, and it was asked at eight o'clock, well, how much did you get back? How many, are you thinking that perhaps? I'm not gonna tell you. <laughs> no, I'm not gonna tell you. The more important thing is the experience of those 20 because that experience rubbed off on the other members of the parish because it asked them to do something inten intentional about their life in Christ over a short period of time. And they felt that it was a valuable experience for themselves. I ask us, do we live out of abundance in our life? Or do we live out of poverty? A sense that we don't have enough, we're not gifted enough, we've missed the boat, maybe. My sense is we all have abundance. Maybe not out here, but in here, where we live and move and have our being. And that can translate into gifts of the Spirit working that you don't even know or experience, but others can feel and appreciate in their lives. And so today is about time, talent, and money all three equally. And I ask that we look at that in terms of the abundance that you possess, the talents you have, and how God is moving you to do whatever you do in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.